Hello everyone and welcome to the Sustainable Development eTalks series co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management in Law. For today's talk, we are indeed honored to have with us as keynote speakers, a formidable du duo of Mona Sabela and Maha Abdullah, all forced to woman power. Mona is Corporate Accountability Working Group Coordinator at ESCR Net, that is International Network for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And Maha is on the board of directors of ESCR Net and also part of the project advisory group of ESCR Net's corporate capture project. Uh, she is a former legal researcher and advocacy officer at Al Haq in Palestine. So we have Maha from Jerusalem right now, and Mona is currently in Ireland. I'm in India. Uh, Maha and Mona will tell us why the binding global treaty on human rights and business must address corporate capture. A very warm welcome to Ms. Mona Sabella and Ms. Maha Abdullah on behalf of the students of Indian Institute of Management in Law. We are immensely privileged to have both of you here today on Sustainable Development eTalks and are looking forward to interacting with you. Well, our first speaker for today is Mona, who is Corporate Accountability Working Group Coordinator at ESCR Net. Over to you, Mona. Thank you so much, Shobha. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, and thanks for um, Bobby and the Citizens uh, news, serv news Service for having us as well. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy in these very difficult times. Um, and we really appreciate all the important work that you're doing and, and the series of e-talks. Um, it's really, really important. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of a background about ESCR Network, um, if I may. And then I will, um, I will talk a little bit about the treaty process, where it's at, and then we'll hand over to Maha to talk about corporate capture and why it's really important to um, discuss it and, 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 and ensure that it's uh, um, reflected within the treaty in terms of trying to overcome it and, and regulate corporations and so on. Uh, Mona, um, can I interrupt a little bit here, please? Absolutely. I would also like you to explain something about corporate capture to our audience. Uh, to some of them, the term may be very new. So just during your Absolutely. talk. Yes, Absolutely. Thank you. So Maha will be talking more about it, okay. uh, but it's yes. essentially yes. Just, a, just a very brief overview in one line. I would describe it as the undue influence of corporations on government decision making and on policies, whereby they essentially um, try to uh, create policies that will ultimately benefit them and, and elevate um, their profiles and, and their capacity to, to make profit, essentially. Uh, but Maha will be um, elaborating on that a lot more in her talk. Um, so, and please feel free to interject at any moment if there's anything that's not clear or if you'd like me to talk about something a little more or a little less for that matter. Um, so the network um, is first and foremost led by our members. Um, we are across 75 countries. We have over 280 members um, from grassroots groups to social movements, to NGOs, academic centers uh, and advocates. We're all united by a mission to secure economic and social justice through human rights. We do our, a majority of our work through facilitating um, joint actions, enhancing communications and building solidarity within regions. Um, and with that, the network has sought to build a, a large global movement to make human rights and social justice a reality for everybody. Um, and we do our work uh, guided by our core principles, which, is, which are that, um, uh, which aim at the advancement of all human rights. 
um, with a focus on economic, social, cultural rights issues, um, which aim at ensuring a regional and gender balance in leadership, intersectional gender analysis, and making sure that there's centrality of grassroots groups and social movement in our work. Um, and we also make sure to ground the network activity in the lived experience of people who are resisting economic, social, cultural rights uh, violations and work um, to advance concrete collective actions that are able to affect systemic change. This is really at the core of what we are trying to, to do is change the narrative, create systemic change that we really need at, at this time, but we have needed for a really long time. Um, and we share, we, we strive to do this through shared analysis and consensus in the decision making um, as a, a member led network, of course, uh, while respecting the autonomy of our individual uh, members. So that's in brief about the network. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the treaty process um, uh, now. Um, and, and before that, maybe I'll mention ESCRNet's global call to action that we put together in response to the COVID-19 crisis through our members, um, where they called, one of the, the main issues that they called for is uh, the support for negotiations of an international legally binding instrument to regulate corporate power. Um, so this treaty process actually started quite a while ago. Um, the resolution for, uh, well, mandating um, the Human Rights Council to develop um, a, a legally binding treaty was passed in 2014. Um, and at the time, the resolution was drafted by Ecuador um, or presented by Ecuador and South Africa who were leading on this process. Um, later uh, down the line, uh, right now, uh, Ecuador is more so leading, but South Africa still has a very important and key crucial role in this process. Um, and it's important to note as well that this process comes after the establishment of the UN guiding principles and the voluntary uh, national action plans that many countries are uh, in the process of developing and some have already developed for, for quite some time now. Um, as many of you probably know already, um, India is in the process of writing their own national action plan on business and human rights in, in correspondence to, with, the, with the UNGPs. Um, and they've said uh, it's, they're going to publish it in 2020, so this year. But as far as I know, this hasn't um, happened yet. Um, so a national action plan is well and good. I think it's important, but um, it's been very clear that voluntary guidelines fall short from an urgent need to regulate corporate power and prevent them from harming, our, from harming us, from harming our rights, from harming our environment. So um, by nature, as, as some of you also might know, the national action plans are voluntary. They're not binding, um, you know, uh, there's, it, it, it presents a soft commitment uh, to adhere to the principles that are uh, laid within uh, international law in relation to corporate uh, uh, responsibility for human rights, uh, respect of human rights. So the UN guiding principles are important. Um, they do uh, encompass a lot of really important international legal standards um, but at the same time, after almost 10 years on their publication, because they were published, I believe, in 2011, um, you know, we're the asking for a soft commitment or, or a voluntary commitment to them has fallen short from ensuring that corporate activity is appropriately regulated. Um, and that said, the national action plans uh, you know, can be good as a basis for national legislation to regulate corporate power, which is what we are trying to achieve through the international legally binding instrument. Um, many ESCRNet members have been calling for this binding treaty because it's seen as an additional and really necessary tool, tool to ensure 
an end to corporate impunity. Uh, Maha will be talking about corporate capture um, and how the lack of corporate accountability harms us and our rights and our environment, whether in times of crisis or not but um, uh, in relation, and, and specifically in relation to corporate capture, but going back to the treaty process, on 29 May, which is this Friday of this week, as well uh, on 12th of June, there will be an opportunity for social movements, other civil society organizations, as well as states, to participate virtually in informal consultation sessions that will be taking place as part of this intergovernmental process to negotiate a text on the legally binding of the legally binding instrument um, to regulate corporate power. The good news um, is that India voted in favor of the UN binding treaty to regulate corporate activity, or at least um, in favor of creating this UN binding treaty um, when the resolution was passed in 2014 during the Human Rights Council. During um, the last intergovernmental session on the treaty, which usually happens every October in Geneva, this is when the major event happens when all the states come together within the Human Rights Council and negotiate the text of the treaty. The Indian government made a general comment, um, and I think this was the, um, you know, this was the most that they uh, contributed um, within that session, but they made a general comment about how the international uh, community needs to recognize business responsibility to respect human rights. They mentioned that the adoption of the UN guiding principles was a significant achievement, but then they mentioned as well that through Act 13, India has advanced had advanced on the domestic front in recognizing business responsibility of companies. So they mentioned also that the process of the treaty has significantly moved forward and they have always been support and that they have always been supportive of it. And then they commented further that we need thorough negotiations on the content and that India is committed to constructive contributions. So I think that's quite important to know just because um, it's important for us to follow up on on the on this statement and on India's uh, the Indian government's um, statement saying that they are committed to constructive contributions, I think regulating corporations, both state and non-state owned, is essential. And it is true that what will be key in making uh, these regulation, this regulation a reality um, and producing a strong legally binding instrument or treaty will be uh, the negotiations on the content of this treaty. So ESCRNet members have been calling for a strong legally binding treaty um, in content and uh, in implementation. So trying to over, uh, trying to uh, kind of imagine how it would take place uh, once it w once it is passed and how we will work on implementing it as well as the content um, in the text right now and and that's been happening for long before we had a zero draft um, members have engaged in contact in content um, even prior to the zero draft uh, producing some key principles that must be um, um, included in this draft and so on. So civil society, including social movements, have really been key to this process, including uh, to getting this resolution passed through the Human Rights Council. Um, and for this reason, um, there are several states who in the last October session attempted to silence uh, civil society and limit our participation in this process. And this is why it's important now more than ever to have as many civil society organizations and social movements engaged in this process. Um, and the meaningful participation of social movements um, and civil society will strengthen the text of the revised draft legally binding instrument uh, that was released last year. 
and it will serve as a basis, uh, this draft will serve as a basis for the negotiations that will be happening in October of 2020 um, in Geneva, or virtually depending on where we are um, with the coronavirus crisis. Um, so I, I wanted to share a video with the help of Shobha um, that several of our members put together to call for a strong legally binding treaty to regulate corporate power um, and calling for others to join us in this process um, and in ending corporate impunity. So um, if possible to show the, the, the video, that would be great. We are facing a global crisis. Mucho antes del COVID-19, el sistema económico dominante había fallado a la mayoría de las personas. The dominant economic system benefits corporate elites and the wealthiest 1%. En crisis, los gobiernos capitalistas no están actuando para protegernos. Big corporates continually work to capture our government. Los grupos de presión corporativos están imponiendo políticas que nos perjudican. Políticas que les dan miles de millones en tiempos de crisis. Corporations are pushing to restore an economic system that violates our rights. We need a just recovery. We demand a new normal. We demand a new normal. We demand a new normal. Exigimos una nueva normalidad. Exigimos una nueva normalidad. We demand a new normal. Exigimos una nueva normalidad. We demand a new normal. We need to end corporate capture of the state and effectively regulate corporations. Mucha gente lo lleva exigiendo desde los 70s. Enough is enough. Corporations must be tamed now. For more than five years, we have been advocating for a legally binding treaty on human rights and businesses. Ahora más que nunca necesitamos impulsar el proceso. We need a stronger United Nations, a stronger call for a binding treaty. We call on states to participate in this process and negotiate for a text that meets our demands. Los pueblos indígenas quieren autodeterminación sobre sus territorios. In crisis or not, people should be prioritized. Workers' rights should be prioritized. Corporate activity should not be contributing to war crimes and conflict. Los defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos siempre deben estar protegidos. Women's rights and gender equality are more important than profit making. We should be able to hold corporations accountable in their home and host states. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. To make choca. A bohot choca. Tofa helkin. Man podleo. Wane. Bas. Bohot choca. To koi. Is high. Basta ya. Queremos vivir bien. Habrá una consulta informal en formato virtual el 29 de mayo. Esperamos una participación estatal fuerte y significativa. We will be there to advocate our demands and challenge state in action. Convocamos a movimientos y organizaciones sociales a que se unan a nuestro llamado. Los estados deben garantizar nuestra participación significativa en ese proceso. The day after tomorrow must be ours. Enough is enough. Basta ya. The future is ours. Can we clap for the video? That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Shobha. Thank you so much for, for showing that. Um, so as you all saw, um, this really powerful, strong call highlights um, how big corporations and, and the wealthiest 1% have really captured many of our government institutions and lobbied for policies that violate our rights and harm our environment. Um, Corporations have also uh, captured several multilateral processes to pre prevent the regulation of business activity. And this is what we're trying um, to um, advocate against um, in, in this process of the, the treaty negotiations um, and, and, and in strengthening the text of the, the, the treaty. Um, in time of crisis and beyond that, we need systemic change. Uh, we need 
uh, a new political and economic model that will prioritize human rights over profit making and allow us to hold corporations accountable. Um, and you can join us um, in this struggle by registering uh, to participate in the informal consultations um, and help us in advocating for a stronger legally binding instrument. Um, as I mentioned, the first consultation is on 29 May. And the second is happening on 12 June. Um, it's important as well to advocate with the Indian government to make strong contributions and interventions aligned with our key demands uh, for a stronger treaty text. Um, and it's also important to share, um, um, you know, your analysis and 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 your important work um, with the the wider network um, in order to ensure we have the strongest possible text for the treaty that reflects a lot of what is uh, going on in different countries and different regions. So I think I'm going to stop here because I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, uh, but I am happy to answer any questions um, after, um, afterwards or whenever is appropriate and happy also to talk about some key uh, demands uh, and necessary changes that we identified as ESCRNet members uh, for a stronger treaty. So thank you all for lending me your ear and thank you Shobha. Thank you, thank you. So you'll come back to us sharing those main yeah. points uh, later on, yes. And we will have the question and answer session later on uh, once uh, Maha speaks. Okay, thank you Mona. Thank and you, I, Shobha. I now invite Maha Abdullah, member of the board of directors of ESCRNet to share her thoughts. Over to you, Maha. Thank you so much, Shubha, and a big thank you to the organizers as well for this very, very timely event ahead of the consultation process at the United Nations on the draft binding treaty, which uh, starts in two days, as Muna mentioned. In uh, my intervention, I will be talking about how it's not only that companies are avoiding liability because there's no re uh, regulatory framework to uh, put them in order and tame them, but they are also exercising a lot of influence on governments and decision makers to advance their interests and profits. And I'm sure that we have uh, all been witnessing in our different uh, locations around the world the ever-increasing power and influence of these corporations on, on governments, on decision makers, legislators, and others to advance and protect their corporate interests at the expense of our rights and the environment. And with uh, largely insufficient or even at times non-existing regulatory frameworks for companies to uh, regulate their harmful activities or their activities in general, along with the state of existing inequalities in resource distribution and uh, power allocation, corporations and their associated entities remain in the lead in prioritizing profit over people. And for many, defying corporate related violations is life threatening and even criminalized at times due to the power and influence that these corporations have. This is particularly true for indigenous peoples, for land and environmental uh, defenders who continue to be subjected to repression and suppression of their rights and will to genuinely exercise self-determination and to decide how their land and their resources would be utilized and protected against corporate interests. And I mean, in the different parts of the world, we also see various ways through which corporations have manipulated and co-opted government institutions and decision-making bodies, whether at national, regional, or international levels, an act that could be coined as corporate capture. And this ph phenomenon of corporate capture has given transnational corporations in particular growing economic and political power, allowing them more and more to be able to block, weaken, eliminate legislation and policies to avoid accountability and transparency. And this has resulted in undermining, undermining our human rights, our environmental rights, and in companies being involved uh, in serious breaches of international law, in uh, violating uh, human rights, and sometimes even uh, being involved in crimes. 
But before I go into discussing the different manifestations and what corporate capture could and may look like in the different contexts, I would like us to watch this short but really powerful video that captures the essence of what corporate capture is. I think we'll be streaming the video in English and uh, Hindi, uh, if I understood correctly. Yes, yes, yes. Please. Great. The coal mining company promised us jobs, development, and a booming economy. Some of us did get jobs, but life became harder with little control over our daily schedule. And soon, our baby got sick with no signs of getting better. And we weren't the only ones who were getting sick. I had to get to the bottom of this. What I found was a complicated story involving elected representatives and business people working together and changing any law that got in their way. This problem is bigger than me. I knew I had to join with other voices to be heard. They heard me and tried to silence me. And it felt hopeless. The doctors, politicians, the police all believed that the company was only trying to help. Thanks to a network of human rights defenders, I got my freedom back and my voice is even louder now. Because this problem is bigger than our community. It's not just about one coal mining company taking over our community, our health, and our lives. It's how they do it. And how did the people who are supposed to represent us begin speaking for the company and convincing us to trust the company too? It's a complicated story, but one thing is clear. Company profits are being considered more valuable than our lives. So how do we fight for people over profits? The human rights community has started to use the words corporate capture to refer to this trend of corporations taking over our hard-won democratic institutions. Corporate capture happens when companies manipulate our local governments for their own private profit. It happens when politicians favor the corporate donors who fund their campaigns over the people they're elected to represent. It happens when elected officials go on to work for the corporations they used to regulate, and when corporate employees get appointed to public positions. Because corporations understand the power that we have as a community, they invest their resources to convince us that they are socially responsible corporations. Much like with what happened to us here, that mining company opened up a community hospital and donated medicine to distract us from knowing that they're contributing to the cause of our illness. All of this is corporate capture. Together, we must start exposing corporate capture and demand that our governments do their jobs and protect our rights. Do you think you've seen corporate capture happening in your community? Share your story by answering this short survey at escr-net.org forward slash cc. कोयला खनन कंपनी ने हमसे नौकरी विकास और मजबूत अर्थव्यवस्था का वायदा किया था हम में से कुछ को नौकरियां तो मिली पर अपनी दिनचर्या पर हमारा नियंत्रण कम हो जाने से जीवन और कठिन हो गया जल्दी ही हमारा बच्चा बीमार हो गया और उसकी तबीयत में कोई सुधार नहीं दिखाई दे रहा था बीमारी केवल मेरे ही घर में नहीं थी मुझे इस बात की तह तक जाना था जो मैंने पता लगाया वह एक जटिल कहानी थी जिसमें जनप्रतिनिधि और व्यापारी वर्ग एक दूसरे के साथ सांठ गांठ करके उन कानूनों को बदल रहे थे जो उनके काम में अड़चने पैदा कर रहे थे यह समस्या मुझे अकेले से बहुत बड़ी है 
मैं समझ गई थी कि अपनी बात कह पाने के लिए संगठित होना जरूरी था उन्होंने मुझे सुना और मुझे चुप कराने की कोशिश की और ये मुझे निराशाजनक लगा डॉक्टर राजनेता और पुलिस सभी का मानना था कि कंपनी केवल हमारी मदद करना चाह रही थी पर भला हो मानवाधिकार कार्यकर्ताओं के एक नेटवर्क का जिनकी वजह से मुझे अपनी आजादी वापस मिली और अब मेरी आवाज पहले से भी ज्यादा बुलंद है क्योंकि यह समस्या हमारे समुदाय से अधिक बड़ी है यह सिर्फ एक कोयला खनन कंपनी के हमारे जीवन पर हावी होने की बात नहीं है परंतु जिस तरीके से वे ये करते हैं और जिन्हें हमारा प्रतिनिधित्व करना चाहिए वे लोग ही कंपनी की तरफ से क्यों बोलने लगते हैं और हमें भी कंपनी पर भरोसा करने के लिए क्यों कहते हैं यह एक जटिल कहानी है पर एक बात साफ है कंपनियों के मुनाफे हमारे जीवन से अधिक मूल्यवान माने जाते हैं तो हम मुनाफा बनाम जनहित की लड़ाई कैसे लड़े कड़े संघर्ष से प्राप्त हमारी लोकतांत्रिक संस्थाओं पर कंपनियों द्वारा कब्जा करने के इस रवैये को मानवाधिकार समुदाय ने कॉर्पोरेट कैप्चर यानी उद्योग द्वारा कब्जा का नाम दिया है कॉर्पोरेट कैप्चर तब होता है जब कंपनियां हेर फेर करके अपने निजी लाभ के लिए हमारी स्थानीय सरकारों को प्रभावित करती हैं। यह तब होता है जब निर्वाचित राजनेता अपनी जनता के हित के बजाय उन कॉर्पोरेट दाताओं की तरफदारी करते हैं जो उनके चुनाव अभियानों के लिए धन देते हैं यह तब होता है जब निर्वाचित अधिकारी उन कंपनियों के लिए काम करने लगते हैं जिन्हें वे कभी नियमित किया करते थे और जब कंपनी के कर्मचारियों को सरकारी पदों पर नियुक्त किया जाता है क्योंकि कंपनियां हमारी सामुदायिक जनशक्ति से परिचित हैं, इसलिए वे अपने संस्थानों का हमें इस बात का विश्वास दिलाने में निवेश करती है की वे सामाजिक रूप ऐसी जिम्मेदार उद्योग है उस खनन कंपनी ने एक सामुदायिक अस्पताल खोला ताकि वे हमारा ध्यान इस बात से हटा सकें कि वे ही हमारी बीमारी के कारण हैं। यह सभी कुछ कॉर्पोरेट कैप्चर है हम सभी को संगठित रूप से कॉर्पोरेट कैप्चर का पर्दाफाश करना चाहिए और यह मांग करनी चाहिए कि सरकारें अपना काम करें और हमारे अधिकारों की रक्षा करें क्या आपने अपने समुदाय में कॉर्पोरेट कैप्चर होते देखा है ई एस सी आर डैश नेट डॉट ओ आर जी फॉरवर्ड स्लैश ई सी आरोप इस लघु सर्वेक्षण का उत्तर देकर अपनी कहानी हमसे साझा कीजिए Thank you. Um, uh, so, as we've uh, seen in the video, corporate capture is a global phenomenon, and it's not uh, limited to one community or one region or not. Many corporations are using different ways to uh, manifest what corporate capture could be. And as identified by ESCRnet's corporate capture project and work so far, but based on case studies drawn from members from all over the world. I will briefly highlight some of these manifestations that were also very clear and came out in the video that we uh, just shared with you. And maybe to start with, uh, it's uh, the first manifestation of community manipulation where corporations undermine and block any genuine uh, community decision making and participation surrounding the company's activities on the community's land and resources. So for example, the company would use financial incentives to entice community leaders to support their project Uh, and, and uh, dismiss the will of the community in case they don't want these uh, corporate projects to go ahead. It could also mean the building of a hospital like we saw in the video, but in general, the, the, despite the different means, it would, uh, it would not include any genuine cons consultation with the community members or consider considerations of their needs and demands in the advancement of these corporate projects. And then another manifestation would be economic diplomacy. And here we were talking about ways that uh, diplomatic missions, embassies, consulates have used to advance the interests of corporations from uh, their countries when they're operating abroad. And uh, economic diplomacy could uh, mean that uh, an embassy, for example, defending Uh, corporate activities, even if they are harmful to the community, even if they violate human rights, international law, and damage the environment. So, for example, the, comp uh, the, the diplomatic mission or the embassy could refrain from effectively engaging with the company to stop it from being involved in serious human rights uh, violations. 
And then there's another manifestation that uh, have been used by corporations, which is the judicial interference and the use of uh, litigation methods as well. And here we're talking about the influence that corporations exert over the proceedings, rulings of courts and the judicial bodies in favor of their activities and their uh, interests. And this, of course, uh, hinders the community and individuals from accessing any sort of proper remedy, accountability for corporate related human rights violations. And in some instances, as some of you may be familiar with, companies have also used litigation as a way to threaten or intimidate uh, governments and communities alike with costly lawsuits in order to avoid any criticism or action against their projects. And then on the, on the, on, uh, we have another uh, manifestation that uh, is uh, tied to corporate capture and how corporations use their power and their money in order to pressure legislators and policy makers to advance opportunities or even to remove at times regulations or weaken legislations in order to allow for them to uh, work without any transparency, without any accountability or liability. And, um, you know, corporations at instances that uh, we've uh, documented uh, could uh, provide donations, for example, or financial rewards for officials or sponsor, for example, election campaigns in return for legislation or any other relevant action on that level that would favor corporation and their, and their, uh, and their activities. And uh, almost uh, tied to that, another manifestation of corporate capture would be when, uh, when, when people who are working in the corporate sectors, uh, they would move and work in the legislation or, uh, or public regulator sector. And here, of course, there's a huge con conflict of interest that is uh, bound to be beneficial solely for the corporation and associated entities. And in addition to these uh, manifestations, we also have uh, the privatization of public security services and the use of public security services like the police, the army and other um, actors, similar actors in order to physically protect the activities and the sites of operations for these companies. And here we're talking about incidents where companies would provide salaries or money for these entities in order to suppress demonstrations or uh, to gather intelligence on local communities and to intimidate opponents of corporate projects. And I think this is uh, something that we're seeing more and more, unfortunately. And uh, with, uh, with, uh, with another manifestation of uh, shaping narratives and influencing the public opinion, manipulating the media and spreading dom dominant narratives about uh, the corporate projects, we're also seeing a delegitimization of the struggles of affected groups and communities that try to stand up to corporate interests. And again, this is something that uh, is increasingly becoming increasingly common with uh, increased attacks and campaigns against human rights defenders, land defenders and environmental defenders across the world. And this is something that most of us attending today could relate to. And then one last uh, manifestation that I will uh, briefly touch upon and uh, highlight is the capture of academic research and scholarly institutions, which um, use their financial power and provide financial support to such institutions in order to influence them to produce research that favors corporate interests and boost their public image as a company or as a corporation and completely eliminating any negative impacts of their activities on the rights of individuals and uh, communities or the environment. And with these eight manifestations that I have just mentioned, and which again are based on case studies drawn from members of uh, ESCRNet, they, they vary in, um, in the specific methods of implementation by the different uh, corporations and also depending on the location, 
depending on the context that these companies are operating in, whether it's, you know, a time of crisis, like the one we're witnessing these days, or it's, you know, an, a normal, let's say, uh, context or a conflict affected context. Th these are all uh, variations that would uh, influence how these uh, methods would be applied. And of course, the actors invo involved in, um, in the activities. And again, these manifestations that I just mentioned, they are not comprehensive, but they are still able to give us a clear idea about the different ways that companies have used to increase their profit while becoming more dominant in the decision making spheres and, um, and prioritizing the economy instead of ensuring human rights and environment protection. Again, this is something that we're seeing now more and more being highlighted in light of the COVID-19 crisis, the lockdown and its impact on the economy where we're having governments and corporations prioritizing the economy, the businesses and so on, on behalf of people's uh, right to health, to life and uh, other rights. So lastly, in my last section, I will, uh, I will uh, maybe talk a little bit about what could we do and what has been done already in order to counter this. And clearly, I mean, with, uh, with, uh, with the immense influence that these corporations have not only on governments, but also on our own lives and on our, our own well-being and future and so on, we need to partner together and we need to partner with communities, with social movements around the world to meaningfully challenge corporate capture and put an end to it. And we, while doing that, we need to uh, try as much as possible to reinforce our tools to counter this and make use of existing opportunities, but also create new ones for ourselves. And at ESCRNet's Corporate Capture Project, which was formed in 2014, we aim to challenge the corporate uh, capture by carrying out research, raising awareness, supporting collective action of social movements and civil society around the world. And most importantly, we seek to address the root cause of corporate related human rights violations. And we have worked so far, I mean, in, in, in our project, whether as a corporate capture project or throughout the network as a network, uh, focusing on corporate accountability and also economic, social, cultural rights, we have worked to popularize and mainstream the concept of corporate capture among the members of the network, social movement, civil society, and in all different uh, avenues, domestically, regionally, and internationally. We have also worked to document how corporate capture takes place and how different communities and movements have been facing it and confronting it, success stories, etc. And at the moment, for example, one of our key uh, activities is that we are putting together an analytical report, building on cases of different, uh, um, of, of, from different uh, members uh, on, on corporate capture and the different manifestations that I mentioned earlier from different parts of the world. And we hope that with such an analytical report, we would be able to use it as a tool for political education, for, for us to advance our advocacy and campaigning on the issue in the different uh, places. Another example is the efforts being exerted by the members of the network and the corporate capture project in the process of the ongoing negotiations on the legally binding instrument at the United Nations that Mona was talking about earlier and in which hundreds of communities, social movements, and civil society organizations have been participating in and influencing in the past few years. And I mean, as, as, as I said, this is a, uh, this is a process uh, in the making. It's ongoing negotiations. We don't yet have a legally binding instrument, and it's far probably from being finalized, adopted, and enforced, but it still provides us with uh, a string of hope towards genuine corporate accountability at all times, and to stop the cycle of impunity for corporations, including for their uh, methods and different ways of corporate capture, which has allowed them to profit and contribute to inequality, injustices, and even crimes in different parts of the world. And Lastly, I think for us to be able to respond to this uh, excessive corporate influence and corporate capture in the framework of this binding treaty that we're discussing at the United Nations, we need to first and foremost ensure that 
the process itself is uh, safeguarded against any form of corporate capture and safeguarded and protected, uh, you know, the integrity of the process is also protected. I, uh, I will stop here because I think I have even gone uh, beyond my uh, time allocated. I hope uh, this wasn't too long. And of course, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maha and Mona. And none of your talks are too long. In fact, we are, we are craving for more of it. Uh, for your very informative talk, which is rooted in human rights and development justice. And at this juncture, I would just like to mention for the benefit of our audience that CNS is an organizational member of ESCRNet and we work very closely with them. And I'm also privileged to have lent my voice to the Hindi video, which we saw just now. And the video impacted, the, the English video impacted me more also because it showed how women and children face the worst impacts of corporate capture and injustices and abuses. And as well as then they lead with resilience to take back power also. Uh, so they are the sufferers and they are the sort of people who rise from the ashes as well. Uh, now we open for the question and answer session. Uh, participants, I'm sure you have been fired enough to have many questions. There are questions which are already in the chat box. So please raise your virtual hand to ask your question or type in your question in the chat box. Uh, so uh, so uh, we have some questions which I think have been answered there in the chat box, but it would be better if they are spoken out loudly for the benefit of everyone. Everyone may not be seeing the chat box. Uh, so uh, we had a question from Sartaj Singh. Sartaj, would you like to ask your question? Again, you have... You have yes. So uh, I basically asked for some examples regarding the abuse of corporate power and the and by the power of the wealthiest person towards capturing of state and violating right like the one mentioned in the video regarding the coal sites and the health hazards. So yeah, it was answered in the chat by uh, Miss Mona Sabella. Yeah, no, I think Mona Actually. should answer it. For, just answer it for the benefit of everyone. I think. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. I'm happy to. I, I gave an example of um, what some of our members shared in terms of what they're seeing corporations doing with, within, with the light, in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, across regions, we're seeing uh, corporations trying to take advantage of the situation. Um, in the US and in France, for example, you have um, a giant uh, company like Amazon continuing to, um, you know, uh, work its uh, um, operate or, or, or have operations. I think it stopped now um, after a lot of pressure. But in the beginning, I think one of the main concerns of this corporation was how to continue profit making and how to continue engaging in its business activity without regard to the workers who are um, in these factories um, preparing these parcels um, and so on. Um, but in, in other places as well, like in the Philippines, um, one of our member organization, Taptaba Foundation, talked about how um, Oceana Gold Philippines, which is a mining company, continued its mining activities during the COVID-19 times without a license or the consent of the communities. And despite this government declared lockdown um, that was only allowing any businesses related to food and medicines to operate. Um, and you can see how, you know, the, the profit making was prioritized here. In contrast, you had citizens in the Philippines who were arrested because they were trying to go out of their house and, and, and receive relief foods uh, or relief goods. And then they were criminally charged for uh, their posts on, and some were criminally charged for posts on social media with regards to the government response. Um, it's the same also in South Africa. Um, there's uh, one of our members, Cal's, um, noted that mining companies have successfully lobbied um, the government to continue their operations um, and, and they're advocate, they've been advocating with governments to, to tackle this issue specifically. 
in Brazil, the same uh, mining has de has been deemed essential activity, um, and and this puts people at risk in so many ways. Uh, never mind uh, talking about um, pollution, which is um, which is really outrageous and unacceptable, but also in terms of land grabs of um, and in terms of continuing. Uh, to put at risk uh, workers in light of this uh, crisis. Okay, thank you. Uh, just here, Mona and Maha, why I'm asking uh, you all to speak out the answers because many of many of our audience may like to refer back to the recording which is shared and the podcast. So then they will not get to see what was in the chat box. So that yeah. that is why we wanted to be on record. We have a question from Jan. And Dan, would you like to ask the question yourself, please? Yes. Um, hi, thank you for uh, organizing this webinar. So one question is regarding the COVID pandemic. Now we are seeing that uh, many um, states are facing uh, economic slowdowns and there has been a reduction in trade and investment. Do you think that states might start to prioritize their economic interests at this point, seeing how it is, uh, it is really problematic for a lot of countries which are facing revenue losses? And uh, the treaty process might take a backseat and maybe like uh, push back in terms of uh, the priority list of uh, countries. So considering all of that and considering what would be the effect of the pandemic, one, on the priority of the treaty process. Secondly, whether the negotiations will take place in Geneva this year, considering uh, that it may be virtual. And we know that uh, the virtual meetings have been reducing transparency in the process. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm happy to answer, uh, and I want to provide Maha as well an opportunity to do so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a great, great question in, in the sense that um, I think this is really why we are pushing for states and civil society to engage in the treaty process right now. Um, I think now more than ever, we need this kind of a process because the crisis has shown us uh, that the lack of regulation uh, of corporate activity is, uh, has brought us to where we are today, has allowed corporations to benefit from the bailouts, to benefit from, um, you know, times of need for people um, in order to experience expand their profit making, their profit margins, um, whereas the workers, um, population in, in general, especially those who are in at-risk groups, are really uh, suffering the most in terms of, um, in terms of consequences of, of this crisis. But I think it, it shows that there's only a very small percentage of people um, and, and those who are in the corporate and, and wealthiest 1% who are, who are benefiting from this crisis, but essentially um, our health systems, um, our social systems, have we've seen that they're not really set up to protect us and protect our rights and, and, the, major and the rights of the majority of the people. And this is what the government's resp main responsibility should be. And that's why we're asking to change the narrative. That's why we're asking to have systemic change where we look at restoring the economy and restoring the economic system in a way that is not going to lead us again to this major crisis um, you know, that's, that's led to a humanitarian economic uh, crisis for many, many countries. Um, changing that um, by regulating corporate power would mean that um, these corporations cannot dictate what policies are um, taking place or, or, or becoming a reality in shaping our economic system, our do dominant economic system. Uh, and for, it would mean governments are the ones who are setting these decisions and setting these policies. And under international law, they are supposed to be, and, and they, they're obligated to, to have policies that will protect us 
and prioritize us and our rights instead of the rights of corporations and the rights of uh, business elites, essentially, um, who you know um, have have really controlled how um, how crisis response looks like, and in a way that is not really benefiting us right now. Uh -huh. Sorry. No, thank you, Mona. I would just. Uh, I, I totally agree with your uh, with your input on this question, and I think then what the question you're posing as well is very important. Whether it will uh, lose momentum because the priorities are changing for governments and people alike, and for businesses, for everybody, for institutions, and the focus has shifted. And I think this is where we come as civil society into to play the key role into uh, telling uh, institutions like the United Nations, telling the, the the UN member states that no, that we're still uh, insistent that this binding treaty is important because it is. It won't solve all the problems surrounding uh, corporate uh, activities and unlawful uh, activities that these businesses are doing in so many places and all the human rights abuses but it will set some sort of uh, of a line and it will uh, tame in a way or another their uh, the corporate endeavors so again i think that uh, this is uh, where the responsibility lies on us at the moment to go to our own governments at a national level and tell them listen we need you to be present and we need you to be strongly and effectively engaged in this process you can't just go and uh, and undermine this process or you can't just sit there in the room without you know contributing to it and hopefully they will listen i i would really hope so. And of course, we need to maintain our presence as civil society within the process itself and see um, how much we can push in terms of uh, amending the draft, the text of the treaty itself, which I think civil society has so far played a key role. It's not perfect. It's far from being perfect, but it has gone uh, a long way from where it was in its zero draft to where it is now, and hopefully we will still be able to contribute to that uh, in, in, the, in the current consultations and uh, the, the future ones. Uh, may your words come true, Maha. Uh, that's what we can hope for. Uh, we have a question from Lisa. Uh, Lisa, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much um, for this webinar. So I would be interested to hear a little bit more about what exactly you are pushing for in this treaty. So if you could write this provision in the treaty, what would this look like? I can start answering that and then Muna, please feel free to uh, complement the answer. Um, I mean, if, if I, the, the ESCR network has developed uh, a comprehensive position on different elements of, uh, of, of corporate uh, activity or, or ways to regulate corporate activities, focusing on several thematic issues, including corporate capture, but also human rights defenders, uh, gender-related uh, gender human rights abuses or the gendered impact, and, uh, and, and, and numerous other uh, issues. Specifically in relation to corporate capture, we have uh, submitted uh, detailed text suggestions on the zero draft treaty previously on how that could be amended to uh, prevent corporate capture uh, in the process in itself, but also in the future, once we have a, a treaty, we could uh, refer to it in, uh, in avoiding corporate capture. We, I can share that with you on the chat, the link to the, to the text. But generally, I think the recommendations surrounding corporate capture in relation to the treaty is that we wanted the treaty or the draft, the text of the treaty, to recognize that corporate capture exists in different ways and that uh, corporate capture can uh, erode public trust in the state and that there needs to be appropriate measures taken to prevent corporate capture and its impact on, uh, on, on human rights and um, sustainability and the environment, etc. And again, the, one of the points that I mentioned and I would stress again is that 
uh, there also needs to be uh, stronger uh, protections against corporate capture and the influence of corporation in the process of the treaty. So we really need to be aware of uh, corporate uh, supported or corporate influence groups uh, and uh, and um, associations or initiatives that are participating in the negotiations of the treaty and that are putting forward the demands or the interests of the corporations as if there's something to, uh, as if they're a positive thing or a, a positive thing to be included in the draft text of the treaty. That's something that is very, very key. And I think civil society has been paying uh, a lot of attention to that, but, uh, at the end of the day, states are um, un unfortunately uh, directed and maneuvered by corporations and the money and the financial power. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question as well as a comment from Rahul Sharma from Hyderabad, uh, who says during lockdown, I read that uh, uh, a news uh, advertisement get paid, uh, the newspapers get paid promoted advertisements of corporations giving good donations to governments for relief. But on the other hand, they are taking measures against their own workforce or seeking benefits from government to reboot economy. Uh, we also know what is happening with migrant, migrants and workforce labor people in India, Bangladesh, Nepal. How can we reboot economy without hiring labor? How will such issues be addressed or checked by the global treaty? Will this treaty take precedence over business or trade treaties? I think this question has been asked earlier also. Or agreements like free trade agreements, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important question. And, and one of the issues that we actually addressed in our um, written submission that I also shared earlier um, with regards to uh, the language that we propose in order to strengthen the text. Um, so in terms of in terms of the primate of, of the the question related to existing trade agreements and will the treaty take precedence I think this is one of the issues that we are trying to work on right now in the text where we have a provision we call it a provision on the primacy of human rights where we are trying to craft language that will ensure whenever the the treaty is um, adopted all uh, states would be looking at their bilateral and multilateral trade and investment and other agreements and um, amending those or um, at least creating um, documents or um, certain um, procedures to ensure that uh, their commitment to the treaty is reflected in these agreements and in, in, in the corporate activity that will be um, taking place after this, this, the signing on to the agreement uh, or to the international treaty. So um, this is one of the provisions that we are working on. Um, additionally, I think the, there's, there's one really powerful thing that, that we are uh, calling for, which is that um, the responsibility of the parent company for the actions of companies in its value and supply chain uh, be, um, be ensured. In that sense, we are talking about, you know, if there are workers' rights that are being abused in a subsidiary uh, company, um, that, that the responsibility lie as well with the parent company for the actions of, of this subs if these subsidiaries in addition to the subsidiaries. And we've included as well that, whether, that, that this responsibility exists, whether there are contractual um, relate business relationships between the parent company and the value and supply chain companies or not. So in both cases, we are trying to work out a system where you can hold corporations accountable at multiple stages in multiple um, jurisdictions um in order to 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 ensure that workers rights are protected and rights um, of indigenous communities are protected rights of human rights defenders and victims in general um, are protected as well 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to add uh, something to what Sartaj has asked. And uh, Mona, you had said that like the alcohol industry had uh, sort of influenced the Indian government to open the alcohol shops uh, when food was not available and still not available to so many of us. Uh, similarly, we have had another example of uh, India Bulls housing finance company, which donated 21 crores of rupees to the PM care fund. And at the same time, it sacked 2000 of its own staff. So uh, one, they are, uh, they are contributing to the PM, PM cares fund uh, for this COVID-19 pandemic, and they are uh, sacking their own staff. So sort of two opposite uh, actions <laughs> taking place. And also the PM cares fund is above any audit uh, and uh, any queries, like any money donated there will not be audited. That is what has been said. So uh, that could be one big way of influencing the governments, I think. Uh, uh, Maha, I have a question. Can you share one example of corporations influencing research and academia? You had mentioned any one example if you could share. I don't have a specific example okay. in mind at the moment, but uh, I don't want to put Bobby on the spot. Uh, maybe uh, he can share with us or Muna. <laughs> I yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, uh, Maha. I think uh, if you look at tobacco corporations like Philip Morris or e-cigarette corporations, uh, th th there is there's so much of junk science which has been produced to push their markets, which is a real shame. Even in the times of COVID, uh, Philip Morris funded foundation which supports a university in Italy. One of their people were, uh, one of their researchers were in, uh, influenced the government for, uh, of Italy to open the, the vaping shops, etc. despite uh, exciting it as an essential item. The, um, so there's a lot of junk science going on. You would have heard about the controversy that nicotine reduces the risk uh, of COVID-19, which is absolutely not yet established. And moreover, it is just the reality is just opposite. The tobacco increases uh, dangerously the risk for non-communicable diseases and tuberculosis, etc. which in a way, and we all know that countries like China, Italy, India, US, UK, France, um, if you look at the COVID-19 data, the people who are having serious outcomes and death, uh, one of the most associated factors is, are these diseases, which are of which the risk factor is tobacco. So instead of holding the tobacco corporations to account and making them pay for the damage which they have caused, the legal and financial liability, the tobacco companies continue to, you know, mint money and trying to deceive us even in the times of pandemic. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, we have a question from Saida Deep, uh, which uh, says that will the country's law or constitution allow overriding by global uh, human rights treaty? Uh, we so much need such laws, but most big corporations in the world, uh, uh, in the world's power rich nations, uh, like Bhopal gas tragedy happened in 1984, but Dow Chemicals is in USA and yet to be brought to account. And those who survived Bhopal tragedy were the first ones to get worst affected by COVID uh, due to damaged lungs and vulnerabilities. Uh, now, uh, we are very uh, honored to have with us in the audience Debbie Stothart from uh, Burma, who's uh, a very senior human rights and justice, uh, human rights and justice activist. And uh, she had answered uh, Saida's question. But Debbie, we would like to invite you to share your remarks, any special remarks you would like to make, please. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to see Mona and Maha in India. <laughs> it's, very, it's wonderful to be in India with all of you. Um, uh, um, and thank you for inviting me to say something. Um, firstly, I think uh, we need to take away the fact that even uh, during COVID, this pandemic, that uh, while we are very um, concerned and even fearful, we cannot allow ourselves to be distracted from the fact that COVID pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is actually exposing uh, very seriously all the uh, gaps in economic justice globally. 
And we've seen the horrific tragedies in India where people had to walk home and people died walking, trying to walk hundreds of kilometers home in such harsh conditions, people not, be, not being able to get basic access to food in this time. So we already start to see that the treaty is even more important. And then the, the pandemic has taught us to examine the treaty further, the draft treaty to ensure that the language, the text that we are proposing aligns with prioritizing people even during emergencies such as this. And let's not forget, when they keep talking about recovery, the fundamental thing that we have to remember, and I, I, I give a lot of economic literacy trainings to grassroots activists, is in any economy, it is not um, capital. It is not lack of natural resources. The, what is that the core of every economy is people. You cannot have an economy without people. And when people hurt, the governments and the people have to pay not the corporations are not going to to say okay let's uh, let's redistribute uh, wealth and make sure everybody have a universal basic income so that we are all resilient against all the challenges whether it's climate change or the pandemic or the intersecting um, impacts so we do need to understand that as we deal with the immediacy of this pandemic that we need to have a resilient global economic system that prioritizes people first. And please, let's not buy the excuse of government saying there's no money for it. Just in the US alone, between mid-March and mid-May this year, US billionaires gain $434 billion in profit over that two month period in one country in the US. What is happening in India? What's happening in other parts of our region? How are billionaires getting richer? How are corporations getting more profit from the pandemic? The reason they are profiting is that we have severe unjust, unjust systems in place. And this is why we need to combat corporate capture. We need to strengthen the language against corporate capture in the binding treaty. We all need to work for this binding treaty because this is the binding treaty that's going to help us redesign our future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure as long as we have uh, women like Debbie, Maha and uh, Mona, uh, we will achieve this. So <laughs> I think we have already, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Women Debbie. like you too. And all the women who are here listening. Yes, 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 that's true. That's woman power at its best. Yes. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, we have already overshot the time by almost 15 minutes. So we will take one parting take home message from Mona and Maha uh, before we close. Yes, Mona and Maha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shobha. And I'm so glad that Debbie, um, you were here and you had this opportunity to, to speak these powerful words. Um, my parting message is that we need to, there's strength in unity and we need to be uh, strong together. And I think the more people who are working on um, regulating corporate power, the more people who are um, taking uh, charge and making sure that governments are held accountable for uh, their responsibilities and obligations to protect us for our rights, then we can work together to build a strong political system, but also a strong economic system, an alternative one that will be benefiting us and uh, protecting our environment and our rights and not uh, only the the big corporate elites and the wealthiest one percent. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, Maha, thank you, Mona. Maha. 
I would uh, also stress the together we are stronger, united we are stronger. What's happening in Palestine is connected to what's happening in India, to what's happening in Thailand, to what's happening in South Africa and all over the world, to Latin America, to the US, Canada, etc. I think the current global crisis that we're in proves that even more, that we are united on this planet. We have something to protect, which is our environment, our planet, and our own dig dignity and, uh, and life and existence. And if we do come together, we will be able to uh, combat the corporate uh, power that is stopping us from achieving that. Thank you very much. And with this, we come to the end of today's discussion, which has really energized all of us to work towards development justice. Uh, in today's SDG Talks, co-hosted by Indian Institute of Management, Indore and CNS, we were listening to Maha Abdullah and Mona Sabela. We will be meeting again on Friday, 29th May at 6.30 p.m. to listen to Patty Lin, Executive Director of Corporate Accountability, on why corporate power and greed is a big hurdle in achieving social justice. Bye till then and stay safe. And our sincere thanks once again to Maha, Mona and Debbie. Thank you, so much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank